Hello and good morning, everyone. It's great to be here again for our monthly staff town hall. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started today. So we've got a great group of panelists uh, on deck today to answer your questions. We had a lot of great questions submitted uh, prior to the event, and we're also encouraging you to submit questions via the Q&A box, and we'll, we'll um, pick some questions from both, submitted before and submitted during the event. And we've got a group of folks who are behind the scenes answering the questions um, via the Q&A box as well. So a couple options to get some information. We will not be answer, or able to answer all of the questions today as we got so many. So you'll find, um, we'll put together kind of the, the top level questions and put them on the Return to Learn site. And you'll find a link to that in the chat coming up here in a minute. And um, as all our webinars have, this has live closed captioning available today for those who would like to use it. So a couple ways you can do that. So you can click on the closed caption bottom, at the bottom or the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen, or you can also click on the link that will be pasted into the chat. So with those housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started. I would like to welcome Chancellor Pradeep Khosla for some opening remarks. Thank you, Haley, and good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, let me just start by saying uh, that we're all very excited that the county has gone from the purple tier to the red tier, and this is positive news. Uh, we, are, we still have a lot of infection uh, in the county, uh, but our positivity rate is at 2% and about 350 people per day are being diagnosed right now with COVID-19. Uh, but, but you can see the trend is clearly on the way down, and this is very positive news. And you can see the same uh, trend on our campus uh, where our positivity rate for the fact for staff and for students has been close to 0.01%. So again, really good news. Uh, slowly, slowly but steadily, we're talking about ramping up our research operations and other operations. So we're already at 25% of research operations and you will hear some uh, in the near future about ramping it up to 50% or so. Um, and all of this has been made possible because the great work and the great resilience uh, that you or staff members have shown. Uh, I don't think we could have reached this point a year later uh, without your resilience, without your hard work. So thank you very much. I really, really, really appreciate this. Let me also say our vaccination program is going well. Uh, the latest numbers I have about 60% of our uh, folks on campus have been vaccinated at least once. And this is more than any other campus that I know of. Uh, so just stay strong. There are some challenges with the vaccinations and their delivery to our campus, but we're working really hard to make sure that our people, i.e. you all, our faculty, our students, and our staff are safe and healthy and ready to come back to work uh, maybe late summer, maybe early fall. Early fall. So right now, uh, we are not expecting the staff to come back until May 31st, but I can imagine that the supervisors might decide some of you might want to come back uh, and may decide based on need. So with that, I'm just gonna say thank you very much one more time. I'm hoping that we are close to the end, uh, but always remember that there could always be a new surge and that's what I worry about the most. So in the meantime, keep on taking all the precautions, keep on doing the good work, the hard work, and thank you again. So back to you, Haley. Thank you so much, Chancellor Kosla. I would now like to welcome um, the host of our town hall today to the podium, and that is our Chief Human Resources Officer, Nancy Resnick. Thank you, Hallie, and good morning, everyone. I'm Nancy Resnick, and I am proud to serve UC San Diego staff as your Chief Human Resources Officer. And um, I appreciate you coming today. It's great to have this opportunity to connect um, through our staff town halls. And uh, we have so many colleagues today who have joined. Uh, we had close to 1,400 uh, folks registered as of yesterday. And my screen says 1.1K right now when I look at the participants. So we're very excited to have you with us. Um, this month, as we all know, um, has marked one year since UC San Diego's operations shifted significantly in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. For our frontline staff, uh, this meant continuing to step forward every day to keep our campus safe and operational. For many of our staff as well, um, this meant um, a very sudden shift to remote work um, in order to support uh, and, and comply with new social distancing and public uh, safety and health guidelines. This time last year, it's kind of hard to uh, 
to remember the mindset that we had, we were just getting used to wearing masks. We were um, quite frankly, trying to keep ourselves um, supplied with toilet paper. We were uh, thinking for many of us at that time that we would be back um, to onsite work uh, for those who had left the workplace in just a matter of a few weeks. So if we fast forward um, to now, uh, one thing I will recognize is there, there has been and is a continuing aspect of wondering when will life get back to normal and, and what does that normal look like? Um, when we fast forward for, to, for where we are right now, um, as, as we heard from the chancellor, we have very positive news with the vaccine rollout continuing uh, to expand and accelerate. And it's very exciting to see our conversations uh, begin to shift as we look ahead to the coming year. I do want to acknowledge, um, however, that this has been a profoundly impactful year, um, not only for UC San Diego, but across our nation. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, systemic racism and violence, a deeply divided political landscape, um, fear for our loved ones, and loss or losses that we have experienced. So as the pandemic and the disruption to our lives, um, it you know, continues uh, notwithstanding very positive um, and, and very optimistic indicators for the future, um, I wanna call out that many of us have experienced um, a, a lot of emotional impacts from this time, um, including increases in anxiety, in loneliness, and in sadness. Um, we want to uh, share today in the town hall um, a, a message from Crystal Green, who runs a Human Resources FSAP program, Faculty and Staff Assistance Program, um, to share with us resources to support ourselves and our colleagues who are experiencing grief and loss, um, along with some additional information about other services offered by FSAP to support our campus staff and faculty. Um, last week, uh, Chancellor Kosla shared with us an update about UC San Diego's gradual phased return to full campus operations by the start of the fall quarter. Um, and we know that this is a very top of mind topic. The question of returning to campus um, is a very top of mind question for many of us. We've seen many questions um, around this topic and it's understandable because this impacts our lives in a very real way. Um, we, we will continue to uh, approach this through a commitment to safety, through an eye toward innovation. And um, we, our leadership, our vice chancellors and senior university leadership are currently in the process of determining what a return to campus for our campus staff will look like going forward. We'll have an opportunity to speak a bit more about that later during this town hall. Um, and and I, I will say this um, again, we know this is um, very understandably a topic of, of considerable interest as it should be. Um, and human resources will continue to keep you informed um, throughout this next phase of our return to campus. I'll continue to share updates in these monthly town halls and in my uh, regular updates from your CHRO message that goes out, as well as um, we will have updates through the Return to Learn website and in other ways. Um, we'll be also introducing a dedicated point of contact uh, in, some, in central campus human resources for your questions around um, returning to campus and ramping up campus operations. And I do wanna recognize, and we've seen this throughout this, this past year of the pandemic, um, this does remain a rapidly and continuously evolving situation. There are very many complex factors at play and uh, those will impact the decisions made by our campus leaders. So the fact is we, we may not and do not have all of the answers right now, um, and we do remain committed to bringing you up-to-date information just as often and as soon as we have it. And of course, the, con the, the, con the continued top priority for all of us remains the safety and health of our campus community. So with that, um, let's get started. Back to you, Hallie.
Great, thank you so much, Nancy. So we'll jump into our updates now. And as we've done at our past couple events, we're gonna start with some medical updates. So I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Angela Sosha. Angela is the Interim Director of Student Health and Wellbeing Services. And she'll just give us an update about the pandemic and get some vaccine information. So take it away, Angela. Thank you, good morning, everyone. We're gonna cover quite a bit of information today. One, as you probably are aware, the national picture is better. That doesn't mean we can ignore the fact that there are close to 30 million individuals have been infected by this virus. And while most of the country is coming down, we are starting to see some states with the daily positivity rate going up. The number of new cases in certain states is going up. So the reminder, as the chancellor said, that this can change very quickly. And if we drop our preventative measures, there's no question this virus is quite capable of surging right back. So let's stay on top of all the good things we've been doing because I have some really good news to share about how the campus as well as San Diego County are doing. Next slide. So in California, you'll see that most of the state is actually making good progress, um, but there are some areas inland that are still struggling uh, it, with the virus. We are doing quite well. Uh, we've moved to the red tier in San Diego. Uh, and next slide, I'll show you that actually we're meeting some of the metrics that suggest we will be in orange tier in San Diego quite uh, soon. Um, as we look at these things, we make decisions about campus operations that are consistent with what's going on in the state and the county, but not necessarily matching it perfectly for good reasons because of the nature of the campus community and the interactiveness that we have. So the CMT team is watching all of these things very carefully. And when we can, we are trying to expand opportunities um, increase the interactions that can occur on campus in a very safe way. So we are paying very careful attention to how the county is changing. Next slide. So in the county, we're seeing a lot of green markers. This used to have half red, I would say a few weeks ago. We're still seeing outbreaks in the county, but we have plenty of hospital capacity, ICU capacity. We're able to actually return to normal operations within our healthcare environment. So these are all very encouraging signs um, that the county itself is doing very well. And if we don't experience a surge and we don't too prematurely open too many things up, we should do very well over the next few weeks and months. Next slide. So on campus, I wanna remind everybody that testing has been really important. Um, some of you may have been vaccinated. I'm gonna talk about testing with vaccination, but by and large, we want the entire campus community to continue to testing if you are coming onto campus. Our students who are on campus for living or learning or research, they are also testing on a weekly basis. We have not changed that recommendation. One of the things that is working very well are the vending machines. But I wanna remind everybody a couple things about the vending machines. One is when you get that vial, the, up until now, you've just been able to hit a button and a vial would drop down. In the second week of spring quarter, we're going to go to using your ID, your university ID to swipe and that will release a kit. So remember that will start, make sure you have your ID with you. If you don't have one, get a new one. The um, office that provides IDs is prepared to do that very quickly. So please make sure you have your campus ID with you. That's how you'll get a testing kit. The second part is we need to know it's your sample. And the way we do that is a barcode, which is on the vial. You need to go to the UCSD app, open it up, scan the barcode, get confirmation, you'll get a little green check that the barcode has been successfully scanned. We're still seeing individuals a couple percent and it's been a, happening a little more with employees. It used to happen a lot with the students, but they've gotten better where we get a sample, but we don't know who it belongs to. So it's really important that you have this step completed. The other thing, if by chance you do not have your results within 48 hours, because most of the time the test results are back the next day. If two days later you do not have a result in your my chart, then please retest. It could be that something happened with the scanning process and therefore your sample has not been processed. So please 
Within two days, you should definitely have a result. Also check for your result. Don't assume if nobody calls you, it must be a negative result. So these are some of the things you can do to make sure your testing is working quite effectively. Next slide. Now, these are the new locations. As you saw in the preview at the start, we have expanded a number of new locations for testing, including the drive up sites that are at Osler and North Torrey Pines. Um, we want you to, the app will also show exactly where um, you can be tested. We're doing about 2,000 tests a day. Next slide. And how are we doing? We're doing really well. I can tell you this weekend, we had no students, no employees. Um, yesterday, we finally had one off-campus student and again, no employees. So by and large, we're seeing about 1500 students test a day. And then we're seeing about three to 500 employees test a day. And the rates have been really low. Um, so we're really pleased. This is the dashboard that's on return to learn. Feel free, in fact, I encourage you to look at it quite regularly. The students are on the left, the employees on the right. You'll see the students are broken down into the off-campus and the on-campus students. So this is updated every single day. Next slide. Here are the rates, as the chancellor mentioned. In the counting, we're 2.9. Yesterday, it was 2.8, 2.9. These slides were actually pulled on Friday. I submitted them. And actually, the student number is below 0 0.1, and the employee is just floating at 0 0.1. So we are doing really well as a community, um, our employees and our students. And if you look to the right, our students actually are doing better than their age match peers, which are in the red dots. So people have done a fantastic job with the preventative measures of masking and distancing and regular testing, as well as if someone requires an infection, they're isolating and appropriately quarantining. And that has helped us keep spread to an absolute minimum. Next slide. Okay, I want to share this because this is the wastewater composite. The block to the left is what winter quarter looked like. And you can see almost half the wastewater were positive. This is because so many folks came back to campus after winter break and we felt the surge all over the place. Now, if you go to the far right, you can see that we have days where there's only one or two that are positive and the levels are very low. Sometimes this is an individual who is fully recovered and actually returned to their dorm or their workplace, but they're still setting small amounts of virus that the wastewater is so sensitive it picks it up, but they're not infectious. So we're thrilled that we've gone from the red to the green. This will hopefully, we will not see this in spring. We are prepared though for spring to have some increase. We will be monitoring all the students returning after spring break very carefully. Um, we expect we may see some positives and they will go into isolation and quarantine. And then hopefully we'll quickly reestablish the stability that we've been seeing over the last few weeks. Our students in their residential spaces will resume masking within their residential spaces, spaces until we get that stability reestablished. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna be using wastewater quite a bit as the next few weeks and months evolve as a signal that when we see new virus that we can't explain in the wastewater, we're gonna suggest the, recommend strongly the individuals of that working in that building or living in that building, go and get testing. So testing is gonna stay with us. Next slide, uh, vaccination. Now I wanna share a number of things about vaccination. We're doing really well. I pulled these slides and submitted them on Friday. San Diego County crossed over 18% yesterday. So we as a county are doing very well. Um, our own health system, as well as some of the other sister health systems in the county have really been out there vaccinating the community, as well as the new process, which is engaging pharmacies and other areas to test our community has been extremely effective. Uh, the health system has um, Petco had its last day this weekend. It is no longer open. Baseball will resume. Um, and at this point, we're gonna be focused, the health system will be focused on the REMAX site, 
which was super busy. And in fact, over the weekend um, on Saturday, 2,900 individuals were vaccinated and Sunday's numbers looked equally strong. So that the second dose for students went up by a thousand since Friday and the second dose for employees went up by 2,500 since these numbers were submitted. There has been a focus to get the second doses completed for all the individuals who got first doses based on employment or volunteering. As we get that done, since we've gotten a little more vaccine, we will make sure that we catch anybody who was missed previously um, in the first wave of employees and student employees. We're also working to vaccinate our students with medical conditions. At the site though, we are supporting the community as well. It, RIMAC is not only supporting the campus uh, students and employees, it is also the public is there. So about half the slots are individuals from multiple health systems or employment. They are using the my turn process to schedule a vaccine appointment. And that is something that's really important for your family members who aren't employees. They can use the my turn to schedule um, a vaccination if they have the medical qualifications. Now, if you've been vaccinated, a couple of things to keep in mind. First dose is not the end. Fully vaccinated, that means you've gotten the benefit, the full benefit of the vaccination, takes two weeks after your second dose. And if you, when we start giving the J&J, &J, which remember is the single dose vaccine, again, two weeks afterwards. So after you've had your two doses of Moderna Pfizer, your one dose of J&J, &J, Two weeks later, you're considered fully vaccinated. Now they are changing some of the recommendations for fully vaccinated individuals. And this is important to keep in mind. Fully vaccinated individuals still need to mask. I can't overstate that enough. You need to mask when you're out in public. You do this because a couple of reasons. Even with vaccination, and I'll show you the effectiveness, there is still a chance that you can acquire the virus and could pass it on to others. So you don't want to do that for yourself. The other part is you don't want to pass the virus on to someone else because you have a very mild case, you're not aware of it, and you would inadvertently infect someone else. The longer this virus is around, the more it can replicate, the more we have risk of variants. And the variants are really problematic because uh, we'll talk about them, they are more transmissible. A variant survives because it's more effective. So masking even after vaccination remains critical. We expect to have that masking as part of our lives for quite a while. So don't drop your masks. But what we are changing is fully vaccinated individuals are going to be able to spend time indoors with other fully vaccinated individuals. That is a new change in the CDC. So as as folks get vaccinated, they can spend time with other fully vaccinated individuals inside more safely. Testing for now, we still want individuals coming onto campus to test weekly. This is a little different than the health system where they have stopped testing individuals asymptomatic testing if you're fully vaccinated. Now, if you have symptoms, you should always test it is likely that we will change campus policy when a greater number of individuals are vaccinated and we have stabilized after the return of students from spring quarter and spring break and things look good. We will be making recommendations about ongoing testing needs as we go forward. The other part, if you're fully vaccinated and if you are exposed, you do not need to quarantine, you need to monitor symptoms. But if you're exposed, please call our lines. We will support and explain to you what you need to do. But there are some changes in the recommendations of the past if you've been fully vaccinated. Next slide. Now the variants. The variants are important because they generally are mutations in the spike protein, which is outside of the virus itself. That protein is how the virus attaches to our cells. And these variants have two ways of really being more effective. They either make the virus more transmissible, easier to get infected, shed more virus, or they also have the vulnerability that they change some of the therapies that we have been using quite effectively. The antibody therapies that we've created are less effective with some of these spike proteins. 
I mean, these variants. So we need to really be paying attention to the variants and continue with these preventative measures to avoid more variants appearing. Next picture, next slide. You'll see that the vaccines we're doing using are working very well against the variants. And they have been very effective preventing death and hospitalizations, but there still is some breakthrough at a higher rate for moderate and severe disease of the variants, which is why we really want to be on top of these preventative measures. So the vaccinations work. They all three of them work. We expect that the J&J &J will be coming out and you'll be seeing it in the San Diego community more. Please, if you have a chance, your family members get a chance to vaccinate, please, please vaccinate. It is a very safe and very effective vaccine. And by preventing the virus from moving around in our community, we're gonna stop the variants and we're gonna get closer and closer to normal life. Next slide. So we've been doing some modeling and Natasha Martin couldn't join us today. She's our wonderful modeler who's been working with a team of other individuals um, to look at what can we do safely on campus, taking into account the housing density of our students that live on campus, how we teach, what we do in the research labs, how frequently we should test, how do we use the wastewater? And we have some really encouraging news. I should share that, you know, over the fall and the winter, we did not see transmission of virus in the research space or in the teaching space. We saw it in social encounters um, students or employees who socially spent time with each other. We also know that individuals picked up virus from the community to be, a, you know, that's not totally surprising, but we were very pleased that in our research and teaching spaces, we did not pick up any transmission of virus. So some modeling for the fall quarter coming up, I wanted to share with you on the next slide, which is really encouraging, which suggests at 50% of employees vaccinated, we think we're going to exceed that number. We're getting close to it already um, in terms of we're not there for full vaccination, but we will get there. And then student vaccination. If we achieve these numbers, let's say on the far left, only 25% of our students have been fully vaccinated at the arrival time of fall quarter. We're expecting over the entire quarter, only 12 students to um, be infected. And that's if we were to do only asymptomatic testing biweekly. If we continue with some of our weekly testing, that number drops. And you can see as you move to the right, the number of individuals that will acquire this infection as more individuals are infected goes down dramatically. So we have some really encouraging news to look forward to in the fall. So with those words of, I think, positive uh, encourage, you know, news, as well as some cautions about the really critical importance of the preventative measures going forward, we have a lot to be um, optimistic about. And you guys, um, I just can't thank you enough, as the uh, chancellor has said, amazing job supporting our entire community, the students as well, as well as taking care of yourselves, just truly amazing work. So please keep testing and doing all the good work you're doing. So next presenter. Thank you very much, Angela. I would now like to welcome our next presenter, um, Gary Matthews, our Vice Chancellor for Resource Management and Planning. So Gary, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate the numbers that we have on the call today. Um, our highest priority, as we've said, is campus safety for each of you. And I thought it important to give you some overview of, of what we should continue to be doing. Clearly the masks, uh, and we have certainly asked folks to continue washing their hands and social distancing. CDC has changed uh, some requirements for schools and we're working now to determine what the campus will be required to do. Next slide, please. So part of what's starting to happen is that we have more of our faculty and researchers coming to work in their offices. And it's clear that if you're alone in your office, you, you can remove your masks. But if someone enters the office or uh, even knocks, you should put your mask on just in case. Uh, and most importantly, we recommend vaccinations for all of our employees. Uh, I'll be the first to say that there are many in the uh, 
African American and many people of color have historically resisted getting vaccinated. And I, I want you to know that it's important that we all get this vaccination. Uh, I had my second uh, Moderna dose about 10 days ago, and the, the, the negative impacts were a stiff arm, and I had to take a nap, which wasn't bad. So uh, I implore all of you to recommend it to your, fa to your friends, family, and colleagues. Uh, environmental health and safety, police department and facilities management have been partnering to inspect offices that have been closed. So they're looking for pests. Yes, we have them, uh, four-legged, two-legged, and some that crawl. And, and we're making sure that the, the buildings are as safe as possible. Some of what's also happening is things you'll see and things that you won't see. And a lot of what we call back of the house activity has occurred with uh, testing the HVAC systems, making sure that the uh, filtration is working properly, as well as plumbing systems. I, I noted several que questions within the Q&A about space that is not air conditioned or does not have a building system. Uh, primarily those are spaces that may not have uh, the uh, sophisticated building systems that the research buildings do. What I'd suggest is if you have questions about that space, please reach out to the EOC, Emergency Operations Center, as well as Environmental Health and Safety, who will basically inspect the area to look for the airflow, look for circulation and suggest spacing for staffing. Uh, so it's a work in progress, but clearly the building systems have been maintained throughout the, over the year. Uh, the space restrictions, please continue to follow the elevator, restroom, and occupancy requirements. Next slide. We've done a number of things to support activity, and some of what you see depicted in the pictures are things you can see. So I mentioned some of the back of the house activity that's there to protect you. And these are collaborations. And most importantly, uh, lower left-hand side is one of our staff members uh, retrofitting one of our air handling units to, to a higher grade, almost hospital grade air filter to improve HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, Lockshop has also installed a number of touchless door entry uh, operators across the campus. And we're also, as I mentioned earlier, performing domestic water quality inspection and testing. Our building systems were never designed to sit idle for a year. So we've continued to move things along. Next slide. Uh, I thought I'd mention, and I always like to have a picture of the children from childcare. Uh, some of the things that we've done over the course of the years, little by little, we've begun to open up particularly services. So a number of the services uh, are open for business. The Early Childhood Education Center with the little ones has been open since the fall. And uh, we're gonna do our best to open additional classroom space based on the capacities allowed by the county and CDC. Uh, one thing that's also been a very positive factor is we've got a campus research machine shop and they've been able to fabricate all types of different support for our wastewater sampling tips and other locations across the campus. So folks have been on the campus since the lockdown in March. Uh, next slide. While, while all of this has been going on, uh, there, there are some highlights for sustainability. And, and I know that I've been working closely with folks from the Green New Deal, uh, Students for Sustainability and others. And it's a campus-wide effort that's continuing. Uh, housing and dining has done a great job in, in replacing disposable containers. As many of you know, there's a, uh, a limitation and ban on plastics in the state. And we're doing our best to, to address that. Uh, Integrated procure to pay solutions and logistics just purchased two electric trucks. They're the first on the campus and they made a decision to go green, which is really a, a, something we applaud. We've got a number of light duty vehicles. You've seen the smart cars on the campus for a number of years. Uh, we've also installed additional uh, electric 
vehicle charging stations just to give people a better uh, opportunity to own electric without having to uh, spend a lot of money on an expensive car. Um, Tory Pines Living and Learning opened last fall and it's, it's expected to, to get lead platinum and it's really a share place. Um, and we've been installing water meters. Again, some of the things that you cannot see, but will certainly help the campus going forward and provide a safe environment. Next slide. Green Labs is another program within sustainability that is working to certify laboratories across the campus. And most importantly, within that, it's, it's energy conservation, water, as well as safety. So at this juncture, we have over 102 certified laboratories across the UC San Diego campus. Next slide. So those are some of the highlights that we've achieved. Next month is Earth Month. Uh, the celebrations will continue even though we're still remote and we will have a, an Earth Day and some green talks because we've got to one, keep the planet safe, make sure that we do all we can as a campus to uh, reduce our energy and carbon footprint. Thank you very much. And I look forward to some of your questions or all of your questions. All right, thank you very much, Gary. I'd now like to introduce our next presenter, my colleague, Crystal Green, who is the director of our faculty and staff assistance program. Thank you, Hallie. I'm always happy to come and bring a few um, resources back to you and remind you uh, that we have some excellent services and resources available for all of our campus employees through the faculty and staff assistance program. As part of your benefit of being an employee, you have the um, services and the resources available through our office. And as our chief human resource officer mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, it's been quite a year. Uh, the human condition moves forward, even though our numbers for COVID seem to be getting much better. So with the many things that have been happening, uh, we wanted to bring you today the update on our grief resources, uh, how to deal with loss and move through the healing process of grief. Uh, uh, Hallie actually happened to help us update our link pages and a link will go into the chat box to help you um, get through the, the the pages very quickly. We want you to take a look. Uh, even if you think today is not a day that you're dealing with any grief, uh, if you are familiar with the resources, you know what's there for you. You might even be able to share them with a colleague or a friend. There are some uh, forms that you could download. There are some uh, nice tips on how to talk with someone who might be grieving. And we've even updated a page to specifically address the COVID-19 uh, grief that you might be going through. There are so many things going on in, on our campus, in our community, across our country. Unfortunately, we have had more acts of violence against, um, against our neighbors who are in the uh, black community or the Asian communities. You've seen the notice from, from Chancellor Kolsla and from so many of our um, colleagues across the uh, staff associations and so forth. Uh, these are really difficult times. There are what we might refer to as large grief episodes where we had a loss of life and tragic violence. And then we must also might also be dealing with some um, smaller grief episodes like missing work and missing friends from work and missing our freedom to move about and so forth. In all these cases, whatever you're feeling is important. And it's important to know how to care for yourself and how to find professionals to help you walk through that. So please take a look at our grief resources. Uh, open the different drawers and poke around and see if there's anything that appeals to you or that you might be able to share with someone. And then also think about maybe what you could do proactively to help keep yourself and your family very healthy. We offer uh, no cost individual counseling that is completely confidential. We have many different classes and workshops that we're offering that might help you create a stronger sense of community and the connection to our community, even while working remotely. Or if you're working on campus, you may need a, a connection to those who are working remotely. Um, if you're a parent, if you're a caregiver of any kind, if you're interested in doing what you can to keep yourself healthy, take a look at what our classes and our support groups. And at the very least, click on some of the, the articles that we're sharing, the books that we're reading, including our new parenting and maternal health pages that offer a lot of our best recommendations for what to read and how to stay in touch. 
So during this time where there's so much going on, I encourage you all to celebrate the successes, the innovations, the, the entrepreneurship that our campus has been a part of and how much your hard work has meant. And I also encourage you to take a moment to reflect on what those losses have been for you, what it's meant for you and your family, and to reach out if you need some help moving through that process. FSAP is here for you, and I hope that you'll utilize our service and reach out to us just at any time, whether you're in a current state of grief or if you'd like to bolster your well being at this time. I'm so happy that I was invited to uh, just give you this moment to remind you. We too often forget these resources and um, forget where to find them if we're not actively needing them. So please use that blink page and let us hear from you. Thanks, Sally. Thank you very much, Crystal. I always feel like my blood pressure goes down a little bit after hearing you speak, so it's always a treat. So for our final update, before we move into our Q&A, we're going to hear a little bit about reimagining uh, the workplace. So I'd like to welcome my colleague, Nancy Resnick, who you heard from earlier. And also, um, after Nancy, we'll hear from Kathele Kalfani, who is the Dean of Student Affairs of Warren College. So Nancy. Yeah, thank you, Hallie. And yeah, I'd like to thank Crystal as well um, for those words of uh, insight and support. Um, so uh, return to campus and reimagining the workplace. It's a very big topic, uh, I believe very important for, for those of us who did very suddenly move into remote work a year ago. Um, the question is very top of mind. What, what does it look like coming back? When will we know? Um, we know some things that are very um, definite and then we have uh, work in progress and actively um, active uh, design phase, I would call it for a return to campus, reimagining the workplace uh, phased approach. So uh, as we know, um, those currently working remotely um, will continue to do so through at least May 31st. We're looking at a, a phased gradual approach, uh, not a flip of the switch kind of, um, not, a, not a flip of the switch, you know, move to return. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize there's, there's time that is needed for planning for personal arrangements. It's been a year now since folks have been working remotely, those staff who are doing so. And there are all kinds of arrangements in play um, that are of critical importance to, to our lives. Uh, Childcare arrangements, K through 12 schooling arrangements, uh, elder care, um, all of the uh, ways in which you've pivoted to to adapt to a remote work um, environment, um, these things need to be um, kind of taken into account. So I think that's very important and we recognize that there is a need for time to um, make whatever um, plans uh, and kind of around the return to campus that become, um, that, that they kind of become relevant for the work that you do. We have a really, really broad variety of staff jobs on our campus. So the, the sort of scope and breadth uh, and complexity uh, of the types of jobs done is uh, just remarkable. So just for example, we have folks who are literally out, out at sea through uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. We have staff who balance budgets. We have staff who take care of children. Uh, staff who advise students um, on academic and career matters, staff who support our world-renowned research, um, staff who prepare meals and serve meals to students and others on campus. We have staff who are engaged in fundraising and, uh, and working with our alumni uh, to support our mission. So we, we have all kinds of work operations. So we do not... Um, we, we recognize in looking at the return to campus and reimagining the workplace um, uh, planning going forward, there's considerable complexity in, in recognizing the different types of work operations that exist within the different vice chancellor portfolios. So for sure, we know that, um, again, safety and health uh, of our campus community is paramount and it must be uh, absolutely uh, considered in every way. Um, and we're fortunate to have the, uh, the guidance and expertise from our colleagues on the UC San Diego health side. We're actually extremely fortunate in that regard. Um, we know that there are uh, operational 
commitments to our students, to serving academics, and to serving you know all those who who, who are part of uh, the the mission and vision of our research uh, and teaching. Um, you know our our identity, our kind of core identity, um, and those operational needs are paramount. And as well, we want to look at um, the uh, the ability to consider uh, innovation and creative solutions um, as we think about reimagining the future of work and as we learn from the lessons that we've all uh, learned about uh, different ways to work, different ways to work that we would not have perhaps considered or would not perhaps have thought could be successful a year ago, but we have seen demonstrations of considerable success in that regard. So um, there, they, there are shared principles around uh, safety, around coming through a lens of equity, looking at employee engagement, sustainability, um, and uh, ways in which we, we want to move, um, as I said, through a lens of both returning to campus, but also looking ahead to the future and the, the ways in which we can, we can um, embrace uh, kind of new ways of performing work. And so a really big important part of this um, that uh, we wanted to talk about is to please share your ideas and your experiences, um, your insights, your, your kind of lived experience around remote work and around flexibility is very important to share. Um, and there, there are two upcoming ways to do this and there I, I think will be other opportunities as well. But um, the first of those is that we are relaunching a staff at work survey to specifically ask about um, what has been learned during the pandemic? What has your experience been during the pandemic? What are um, aspects of work that you believe are important and you wanna highlight? I think it's very important to utilize this, this uh, survey uh, kind of opportunity to, to really share your ideas. And um, I don't have an exact date, uh, but when we get the date, we will share it with you. We're anticipating within uh, a few or no more than no more than uh, no more than within a few weeks. Uh, I think it's likely that that survey will go out. And as I say, we'll have uh, more specifics as soon as that is, uh, you know, ready to launch, so that you can look out for it. But it is coming soon, and it is a great opportunity to share your ideas. And then we also have, and I'm going to invite my colleague. Kefele, who's been doing some work with me around reimagining the workplace to uh, speak with us about the idea wave that he has um, led and he's, he's got more specific ideas to share with you. So please, please use these opportunities to uh, tell us what you think and share your ideas. And um, Kefele, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, and as you know, the idea wave is really our opportunity to get feedback and ideas uh, from the staff. So right now we have well over a year's worth of experience of what a remote workplace looks like. And for many of us, what a hybrid workplace looks like uh, and what we can do to continue that success uh, to meet the needs of our workforce. Uh, because we're at a unique uh, time where we have the ability to relook at what that what that looks like um, and being able to try and, and craft something that works for everyone. Uh, so we really want your ideas. There are some ideas that are already there. Uh, so if you can go through, the link is in the chat. Take a look. If there are things that you agree with or you like, uh, like those, add comments, try and make those better. If there's something that you don't see that you think should be there, we'd love for you to add that. Uh, and so through this interaction and this engagement, it really will help to inform uh, a community of practice we're going to build to look at what a new workplace looks like at UC San Diego uh, and something that may not look the same for every employee, uh, something that can be tailored to meet the needs of both our staff and our departments and our supervisors to continue uh, the great work that we do. So you can go on, uh, once again, comment, uh, add new things, uh, review the other submissions, vote on what you like um, and what resonates most with you. And if you don't see it, add it and let's see what that interaction looks like. Uh, so through that feedback, both through this and through our staff at work survey, that's truly going to inform uh, what happens to us uh, from June and beyond here at UC San Diego. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kefele. 
All right, well, thank you to all our updaters. I know we've got a lot of information that we shared today. So we're gonna move into our Q&A now. I do wanna encourage you, if you haven't done so already, make sure to check out a look at the answered questions in the Q&A box. We've got um, close to 40 in there and, and your question might be in there as well. So let's get started. I'd like to welcome my uh, panelists to turn on their cameras and join me on screen. And we'll start answering some of the questions that were uh, asked in advance and some of the ones that we have received today. All right. So Angela, I'm going to send this next question uh, your way and I'm going to read it because it's kind of a long one and I want to get it right. Angela, we received a lot of specific questions about when additional vaccination appointments will open up for folks who either received an invitation but weren't able to find an appointment or for those who have not yet received their invitation. You described the overall plan. Can you share any additional insights into when more appointments might become available and the relationship between eligibility and availability? Hey, there's, there's a lot there. So I think for employees who um, got a first dose through the health system, you will get push tickets for your second dose. If you don't have it by the end of this week, I would let RTL know because they are trying to close that gap of second doses for our employees and pushing out invitations for those. Then there will be a move to pick up anyone who may have been missed um, with a first dose. So that's the overall plan. Vaccine, um, the health system doesn't know week to week exactly how much vaccination it's gonna get and also the types of vaccination, but there are, is a huge effort to whatever vaccine there is, standing up the staff and the volunteers to be able to get all of that vaccine distributed. So invitations are pushed out and uh, they're pushed out both for our own community as well as the health system's patients. And then the My Turn also is allocated certain appointments at REMAC. So you need to keep looking at that site for um, ability to vaccinate, uh, get vaccine at REMAC or one of the other areas in the San Diego, including the pharmacies, take advantage of the vaccine there. So that's, um, I think, the um, overall plan for the process. Great. Thank you, Angela. Well, the other thing on eligibility, um, I know a lot of folks, there is a little difference between state eligibility and the county. The county eligibility was a little bit broader. So if you're in this uh, county, you can use the county eligibility, which is a broader definition than the state initially had. And then you just have to attest to meeting that broader county eligibility in my turn. It's great information. Thank you, Angela. Okay, so our next question, um, I think could either go to Nancy or Terry, so see what you think. Caregiving is a top, top of mind issue for a lot of folks right now. How will the repopulation plan accommodate the needs of staff who have limited childcare options and those with K through 12 children who may not have returned to in-person school? Uh, let me start and then I'll turn over to, to Terry to add as well. These, these um, questions are so important. Um, for so many of our staff with caregiver responsibilities, um, young children, K through 12 children, uh, the move that essentially so many parents, staff parents have made to become essentially teachers, um, as well as doing whatever their job is for UC San Diego, um, the elder care responsibilities, the, the, the very many ways in which uh, our staff have needed to um, kind of do it all in a certain way. Um, it, it's very important that we recognize this and it's very important that we have sufficient time for planning around uh, changes that will be made in, in uh, connection with the return to campus. So I, I will say that uh, this issue is uh, very important, was very much uh, discussed in the focus of uh, both the discussions related to our reimagining the workplace task force uh, into ongoing discussions that are in play around the design of return to campus. Um, and I know Terry um, has some great thoughts to add for us as well. I do, thank you, Nancy. Uh, yeah, to Nancy's point, you know, this has been a very top of mind issue. Um, I can share with you all, I have school age children. I have a six year old and a 10 year old. So this is the most important thing that's on my mind as one of those, you know, staff moms that have been doing it all. Um, I also have elder care issues that go on in my family as well. So these are, these are real concerns that matter 
to us uh, in leadership. And, and we um, are aware that we have no idea what the school districts are going to be doing in the fall, that the school districts are not in session in the summer. Uh, my kids have a year round school. They would normally start back in July. They were delayed last year. We don't know what they're going to do this year. Additionally, and I know top of mind for many parents, there's no vaccine for children yet. Um, so that you know presents a, a very real concern um, for our children, but especially for our children who are in BIPOC communities like my own, where we have a higher um, uh, precedent, uh, you know, a higher presence of the 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 virus and a higher mortality rate for um, people who contract it. So those are very real concerns that we're looking at and considering in our phased approach. These are conversations that we intend to have with all of your leaders before we you are asked to return and, and considerations that we have to keep in mind as people are returning, as well as for the folks who are unable for whatever medical reason are unable to get the vaccine uh, because we want to keep those, those considerations in mind as well. So there are a number of factors, as you can imagine, um, that are very complex that we are all uh, actively talking about on a uh, basically daily basis uh, <laughs> that I'm involved in uh, to make sure that, you know, this is very thoughtful before we ask anyone to return and then that all safety precautions are in place as um, Gary, you know, illustrated for us uh, earlier in this uh, conversation. So it's, it's on our minds and we are very well aware um, of these concerns. Thank you, Terry. Okay, so Gary, next question is for you. Prior to more people returning to work, what additional physical changes or other resources like PPE will be provided beyond what has, been, what has happened for those already on campus? I'll start with the PPE. Uh, PPE will continue to be provided whether it's pr primarily by the departments, particularly in the research areas as it's been done really for the last year. Uh, I had a question in the chat that was also similar to this about the openness of the campus and how are we going to ensure that people coming to the campus wear masks. Uh, there have been thousands of interventions and we like to call it education to start with. And, and so we've been educating people in terms of how to wear a mask. We've also provided masks. So PPE will continue at some level uh, for not only our faculty, staff and students, but also for those that visit the campus. Now, sometimes education doesn't work for everybody, and I know we're a university, but at the same time, we do have folks that arrive here who uh, do not wish to wear a mask, and education continues, but there's an increase in our interaction. So we've had several of our, our student groups referred to student conduct, and, and we've had few people that have been asked to leave the campus and if they chose not to, they were helped along. Uh, I, I do think that uh, going forward, we're going to see more of that and we're gonna follow the county guidelines, CDC in terms of masking, whether it's required, how far we go with it. Uh, I, I wanna circle back to the childcare just a second. Uh, because of the, the guidance we have from the state, we have a very limited offering, about half of what we can provide. Uh, we've already planned for the next phase once we get permission to increase the size. So we may double the number of children within childcare, and that's up to, uh, it's, it's six months, I believe, and don't quote me on the, the low end, but it's up to four years of age. So it's, it's a mix of opportunities between that. Also student affairs through campus recreation has had a number of knock around camps throughout the last year. And, and we are working with them and others to plan for additional camps this summer. But of course, all of that has to be baked into the uh, restrictions and how we do it. And I, I probably missed some of the other questions. I, I, I apologize, but. Gary, you've been very active in answering questions in the Q&A, so you've definitely shared a lot of information today. So we're bumping up right against our time, but I want to ask one more question. Um, so Terry, I'm going to send this one your way. Do you have any updates for us on merit increases or star awards? Well, I don't have the update that everyone wants to hear, which is I have all the answers and you're getting it tomorrow. I don't have that answer. But what I do have um, is that the merit discussion is a system-wide decision. And so as soon as we know what the system-wide decision is, we will you know, share it broadly so that people can know 
um, sort of what's on the horizon. As it relates to STAR awards, we have slightly more local control, but still have to have approval from Office of the President before we can implement. Um, I know that our leadership is, is interested in having a STAR award program in the new fiscal year, so that would begin you know, for July 1st cycle. So if we are given the green light by OP, we expect um, we would be able to start looking at a, a STAR award program in the new fiscal year. So stay tuned. Keep working hard as you have been, and we'll have more information to come. All right. Thank you very much, Terry. So um, stay tuned for more details. And that brings us to the end of our town hall today. So I want to thank all of our panelists. We covered a wide range of topics today. I learned a whole bunch of medical stuff, which I always do with these things, which is so great. So thank you so much for being here. We are collecting the questions that you submit in advance and the ones that you submit um, during the event. And we're finding what those common questions are. And you can find those on the Return to Learn website. So that's always your great source for information. Um, and with that, we'll wrap things up today. So I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time.